afternoon, everyone. So happy to see you joining our stream uh, today. Uh, uh, we are the team of AI and conversation design experts here at Master of Code here in North America. Uh, at Master of Code, we help organizations to design, build, and launch amazing conversational chat and voice experiences. My name is Andrei Burlutsky. I'm head of marketing here at Master of Code, and I will be the host for today's event. Uh, so what are our streams are about? Every week on our LinkedIn page, we share with you short uh, analytics, uh, short insights, and top of mind uh, of CXO from different industries and different areas. Every week, we launch a poll to ask you to vote for the most crucial, from your point of view, uh, top of mind business challenges or trends in particular um, subject area. Uh, and every Monday on we or Wednesdays, we go live with Master of Code experts to discuss how to tackle top of mind challenges or how to understand and explain and explore the different type of trends in conversational AI area. We are live today on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and YouTube. So please select any channel you'd like to join and uh, participate in our discussion today. Welcome to ask any questions or share your thoughts in the comments to our stream. Doesn't matter where you are, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, or YouTube, just please put your questions, comments, thoughts into the comments field, and we will roll out to our experts to discuss and ask. Today, we explore conversation design, and I'm happy to introduce our experts today. Please welcome Amanda Stevens, Director of Conversation Design here at Master of Code. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, thanks for joining us. And uh, our next guest, uh, John Mowat, Manager, Conversational Solutions here at Master of Code. Hello, hey, John. Everybody. Hey, Andre, thanks for having me. Hello, guys. Uh, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, and in order to actually start with why we got together, I want you to share, I want to share with you uh, what we've got as a result after we launched our survey on our LinkedIn page, talking about what are the areas in conversation design audience things are the most important in this uh, in this area so let me start and showing what we've got as a result so the 17 percent of the audience uh, voted for the rise of the voice and I think this topic is very much discussed in different communities from marketing and hardware uh, uh, manufacturers from AI developers and conversation designers then next one, again, 17%, we've got for uh, anticipating bias. I think this topic uh, is not a new one. It's, uh, it's uh, under discussion already for several years. As, uh, and it appeared when we started talking about artificial intelligence itself. And I think this topic is very interesting, can be explored through conversation design area. One more thing is... Uh, error handling and uh, well I'm as a consumer I'm somehow surprised that this point got just zero points from our audience and the last but I think the most exciting and interesting one 67% uh, went to how to grow human side of UX with conversation design so guys in order to kick off our discussion our conversation can you give your reflection on those results based on your experience and projects you are engaged? What do you see, feel when you see on those areas? So yeah. please start with Amanda, yeah, please. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, not surprised, you know, the rise of voice. I mean, we've been talking about the rise of voice for the last few years and every year there's just a further expansion on what voice can do, the complex use cases it can handle. And of course, folks, um, I'm not surprised folks want to learn more about it. Um, same thing with anticipating bias. This has become a, certainly a growing, um, a really important um, topic that people are, 
are really investing more time and resources too. Uh, you know, I think when conversational AI kind of really started to grow in 2018, we were all just figuring out like how to build bots, how to design bots, how to launch them. But um, now we're getting more granular. We're really looking, especially as a designer, we're really looking into how does the language, how does the tone, how does the content affect other groups or the users that it's servicing? Um, are there, you know, we, we all have inherent biases and we have to be really critical about what we design and who we put it in front of to make sure that, um, you know, we are providing accessibility and we're providing, um, you know, user-centric design for and experiences for everyone. Um, in terms of error handling, I think maybe people, folks, you know, aren't as interested because when conversational AI really, again, came out in 2018, I think there was such a big focus on if the bot doesn't know what to do, pass it off to a human. So, you know, perhaps uh, people out there are a little bit more comfortable in how to handle. Cool. Thank you, Amanda. John, you are working day to day with the uh, customers, with uh, with partners uh, inside the projects. What will be your reflection on the results? Yeah, uh, just building on uh, some of the things Amanda mentioned there, I think the way I'm interpreting that 0% for error handling is that uh, people might have put that in under the category of growing the human side. Because a lot of times when we go in and we analyze transcripts of conversations, we see that um, when the user starts to ask the questions like, are you a human or can I talk to a human? That's after they've hit a wall. When they, they tried to do something, it didn't succeed. That's when it starts to become obvious for a lot of people that they're working with a system now and not a human. And that's, uh, that's when um, they start to feel like, where is the human side of this design? It's because mm -hmm. now I can tell it's a computer. So I think those two are very closely related. And, and uh, certainly when you're in working with a system, if you're on a team designing one of these, maintaining one of these uh, conversational AIs, uh, error handling is a daily focus uh, because with uh, with 100,000 users, with 500,000 users out there hammering on the system every day, uh, some of them are going to find new paths through the system, um, ask new questions, uh, throw new patterns that we've just never seen before. And so it's all about gracefully handling that, trying to build a system that can do that and recover um, and, and maybe steer them back to the path we wanted them to follow. Uh, and when we have to um, escalate them over to a human agent who can maybe uh, understand what's going on there. So um, definitely uh, on a daily basis, handling errors is, is always in focus for the teams. Um, but as I said, you know, I think that really relates to the human side of, of design and, and something yes. that we're always getting more sophisticated at. And I know one of the things we're going to talk about in a little bit is, you know, what, what do we look for in conversational designers? What helps make somebody uh, good at that role? And uh, that empathy and that being able to um, build a human feeling system is, is, is a huge, huge factor for us. Uh, John, thank you for bridging um, errors handling and grow uh, human side of UX. As marketer, I look at this um, uh, area as a, you know an additional touch point uh, in the customer journey. I mean, what I'm saying, uh, meaning additional touch, like. Um, if we're talking about, for example, uh, omni-channel marketing, for example, with the rise of voice, we are getting additional touch point how we can engage our customer to talk with our brand, the additional channel, uh, the type of communication, etc. And I know that most of the people, they um, do think and expect that software or uh, artificial intelligence, for example, can work uh, without mistakes. Like, like uh, human, it's allowed for, for the human to make a mistake. The system mm -hmm. cannot do it. And it's not right, actually. There are a lot of things like uh, bias uh, topic, which can, um, which can happen actually all the time when we are talking about conversation AI, conversation design. And in this particular case, we really need to focus uh, how to make this interaction between human and machine more human, <laughs> if mm -hmm. I can say this way. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that uh, I think we've both Matt and I have seen on a number of projects is when when the system is first rolling out, we uh, we see a lot of um, copy where where the bot is saying something like, "Oh, I'm still learning. Can you try saying that a different way?" Or, "I'm still getting up to speed, and my programmers haven't taught me to say that yet." And you can understand why why designers put that in. Um, 
but when you put yourself in the human user's shoes, uh, that's not a comforting and secure thing uh, to hear. That doesn't build the trust in that interaction. And so we usually start um, iterating on those messages uh, yeah. pretty early in the project and, and try to come up with more graceful ways to recognize that we're off on a path we didn't anticipate and, and handle it. Cool. Uh, thanks for mentioning designers. Amanda, I have a question to you as a director of conversation design and master of code. Uh, what is the difference between, difference between chatbot and voice bots when we talk about conversation design? Sure. Um, you know, there are a lot of similarities. So before I jump into the differences, you know, it's still so important for both voice and, and chat channels that we want to be empathetic, we want to have nuance, we want to uh, be conversational. But, you know, there's little details that we want to make sure are really, uh, we changed when we're going from chat to voice, for example, just channel specific words. If you look at a chat bot, you, you may see tap here or view or click. We don't want that in voice, right? It doesn't make sense to view because you, you're not viewing anything unless it's multimodal. So we want to make sure we see words like see and view in chat and use words like hear and talk or listen um, in voice channels. So that's one piece. Um, it's also really important to have shorter dialogues in voice. Mm -hmm. If you are looking at, you know, engaging with a chatbot, it's so easy to consume, you know, maybe three sentences, one, one to three sentences in a content block. We could also scroll up, right? If we, if there's multiple blocks coming at us of content from a chatbot, we can scroll up and kind of double check. You won't have that in voice. So dialogue should be shorter, sharper, more mm -hmm. succinct, so users can easily, um, you know, consume and kind of continue forward without asking for, uh, for repetition. Um, also, you know, just with technology today, there can be longer delays in voice experiences when processing information, connecting to APIs. So we want to make sure we kind of set that uh, expectation for the user by having uh, phrases such as, one moment, let me look into this for you. I know when I talk to Siri and she needs to think a little bit longer, She'll always add, you know, hold on, one moment, right? Kind of prepping me to a, for a little bit of a wait where chatbots, um, again, might be a little bit faster and getting that next information to you. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the main differences that, that jump out to me. Cool, I think it's uh, uh, the first rule of a con content writer writers to be, be short. I mean, don't yeah. try to be to write longer uh, dialogues Absolutely. or text, etc. The shorter mm -hmm. you are, the more straightforward you go to the uh, to the goal you would like to achieve. Definitely, uh, and that's even more important in voice. I mean, we should always be succinct. No one wants to read paragraphs and paragraphs, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely more important to be more uh, succinct in in voice experiences. Yeah, that was the part that you mentioned, Amanda, that I was uh, that really registers for me as a user, not just as a designer. Uh, you know, as as I've kind of introduced uh, Alexa here in in the home, and I've got kids, and then I've got friends who who have it in their home as well. Uh, when you ask something that you've asked a hundred times before. <laughs> but it doesn't understand you this time and it starts going into the I'm sorry I don't know how to help with that or whatever you you know in the first half second that it hasn't understood but it still keeps saying all this text or all, all this verbiage and whereas in a chat bot in a text-based bot at least it's just blatted on screen all at once and you right. can you know okay it didn't understand it you can move on so everybody gets more and more agitated and frustrated cutting it off like okay stop computer stop Alexa you know um, and and I find that, uh, like you were saying, Amanda, that uh, keeping things shorter um, and and Andre, like you mentioned, being succinct uh, is so important in voice because yeah, the the users get agitated very quickly when they're talking to something that feels so human and it doesn't act like a human. Uh, John, your story with uh, um, Alexa reminded me. Do you remember this story when um, um, I think it's. Burger King, uh, for OK Google sentence, all the smartphones or tablets were opening the website. When you say OK Google, the Burger King website was opening. Do you remember this story? It was like a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, I remember hearing about it. And, and uh, also, we start to see that in other, like in movies and TV shows, uh, <laughs> where they'll put in the comments like that to try to trigger people's devices that right there in the living room. Uh, so what a, what a fascinating and unforeseen uh, consequence of the design there. Uh, absolutely. Uh, John, this is the yeah, this is the fun story, great, that we have, like, uh, not only serious, but the fun uh, examples. But w w what do you think are the most sensitive 
aspects that needs to be considered by conversation designer to avoid uh, key bias issues. Yeah, and, and like you guys mentioned earlier, I think that's something that's getting more and more focused now, and, and which is great because it uh, biases an invisible enemy that uh, you know can infect a design in any domain, not just in conversational AI, but certainly it's something we want to be mindful of, and so it can. Uh, it can manifest at a couple different levels. So uh, something as early in a project as how you gather feedback from your stakeholders. Uh, if you say something like, in wording a question to the stakeholders on a project, should we use this emoji or that emoji? You've already implied that you should have emojis in the project, and and maybe that's not the right tone or or um, presentation for that brand. Uh, but the stakeholders are relying on the designers to be the experts mm -hmm. in. in understanding their brand. Um, it moves into how you design the interactions that the user has with the bot. Um, if you start off uh, working with a brand and first delivering on their website channel, uh, you might rely on them having a mouse and that they can hover the mouse on certain controls to get more information. Uh, and then when it comes time to do phase two of the project and port all that over onto a mobile device, all of a sudden you've lost the hover interaction. And so um, those are kind of very like low level design choices where bias can manifest. Um, but I think what the the poll was getting at and, and I think what is the much more uh, important uh, social concern is bias in, in things like accessibility or cultural differences, sexism and racism, and how do those creep into design and into, into um, the end result that we deliver. And uh, one of the um, places that that can really emerge is uh, in the in the process of identifying the user personas. So mm -hmm. early in a project, uh, we're going to work with the brand, uh, work with marketing, work with um, the people that are interacting with the end users uh, frequently, and try to build out um, an understanding of the different segments uh, or demographics that we're interacting with. And so one of the one of the helpful tools there is to come up with a model representative of that segment and so um, if, if, if you have a, a segment in your user base like people with an IT background and now you take my picture and you use that uh, as a, as a light-skinned male with glasses if that's your representative of somebody with an IT background now you've put a bias into that project because now everybody else that looks at the documentation that you're sharing amongst the team uh, and trying to say okay this is a representative of, of one of our segments they're bringing all of their own cultural assumptions into when they see what I look like. And, and and that can have huge impacts on all of the design choices that are made. Um, you know, so one of the one of the ways that you can address that exact like specific example is don't ever use real people as your uh, characters uh, for a user persona. Come up with cartoon characters or uh, have somebody commission artwork for it or something like this, or at least have a variety of pictures that go along with it. Because pictures are a helpful thing, of course, and, and it we are trying to build a representative example of an entire range of people. So that's always a challenge. There's always going to be uh, the opportunity for bias to creep in in, in that kind of a, an exercise. So I, I think one of the uh, most important things is just bringing awareness to that, uh, which conversations like this one uh, and, and all of the literature that's being generated helps with. Um, focus groups can identify that during design. If, if you run early designs and early dialogue copy past focus groups and ask them to flag things that made them feel uncomfortable or made them confused or, or hurt their feelings or anything like this, it can really help to identify those things. And then, of course, after launch, it's all about reviewing transcripts, reviewing conversational activity, and uh, identifying the places where CSAT, customer satisfaction, has dropped off and trying to trace it back to some of those biases that we might have introduced. Wow, that's super interesting, John. And as I understand, so uh, in, um, in AI space, we really uh, need to, you know, like to use different tools like explainable AI to understand how software or AI made a decision uh, yeah. talking to this other person. In the conversation design space, it's everything depends on conversation designer, on his skills, competencies, right? And how he um, asks the question, prepares uh, persona, etc. Am I right? 
Yeah, yeah, and and um, explainable AI is a fascinating topic as well. Uh, and I'm nowhere near an expert in it, but it's something I like to read about uh, for sure. And and you're right. It, it's just to to finish your example there. Suppose all of the knowledge of why we made a choice in a design is in one designer's head, and then that person leaves the team, leaves the company, or whatever. You've lost all of that context and all of that uh, information about why we chose to do things in a certain way. So, you know, one of the things that Amanda and I have um, when we run training courses for clients before is walk them through um, our, you know, we have a template uh, with a bunch of questions built into it for building out these personas for both the user groups, uh, for the bot itself, and then turning all of this stuff into uh, artifacts that uh, can, can persist even if individuals on the team leave and you lose that person who can explain the choices that we had in the design. Cool. Uh, John, as soon as we have mentioned several times already conversation designers, can you give some um, insights on core conversation designer competencies? Looking at our poll, like uh, considering rise of voice and conversation design in voice con interactions or bias topic or uh, human side of, uh, of UX. Uh, so what are the core conversation designer competencies now? Yeah, and, and I've actually learned a lot of this stuff from Amanda. Um, she uh, was part of uh, the, the team that brought me into Master of Code uh, and then uh, helped me kind of onboard into this whole uh, domain because my background was more in traditional software development and, uh, and uh, uh, for interest's sake, I enjoy writing and creative writing and things like that. Uh, but so, so definitely one of the things that we've looked for then um, in, in new people joining the team and that we've advised clients on what to look for um, at the end of the day, it, we, it all comes down to a human-centric, uh, empathetic design. The ability to put yourself in users' shoes, craft a system that is going to account for all of the different backgrounds mm -hmm. of all of the different users. Um, so, uh, you know, different people on our team have, have different skills that they're bringing and experiences in those areas. So, for example, uh, user experience designers. Um, uh, Amanda's got a big focus in advertising, just like you probably do, Andre. Marketing, um, an English teacher who speaks five languages, um, a linguistics expert. Um, for me, it's it's more probably uh, game design, uh, which is one of my hobbies, writing uh, as a hobby, and then, like I said, uh, more of a traditional software development background. But you get all these different skills uh, that we're bringing into the team to help uh, help create a human-centric, empathetic experience. And that's really kind of one of the, the most important things that we look for. It doesn't really matter what the person's background is if they can show that they can help contribute there. Amanda, you've probably done a lot more of that, uh, of, of, of reviewing that with people than I have. So anything more to add? Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, and what I love so much about this industry and this style of work, like this role is, it really lends itself well um, we're having amazing conversation designers with so many different diverse backgrounds. And I always promote uh, folks who are building other conversation design teams have a really diverse set of people. Um, as John mentioned, we, you know, background in game design, we have linguists, we have teachers, we have folks with, like me with advertising backgrounds. I've spoken with people who were in the movie industry that did script writing. Mm -hmm. I've chatted with people who um, have done, you know, audio mixing and, and video where, again, wow. it's kind of taking all different clips and, and pieces and putting it into kind of an elegant output, which is video. So they're all like very much transferable skills. Um, and again, once you kind of teach them the foundations of really good conversation design, um, I've been so impressed by folks, uh, what they've been able to do with so many different backgrounds. So absolutely promote a diverse team to, uh, just like anything, diversity is always amazing. Um, but yeah, if you, if anyone listening wants to be a conversation designer, um, there's, you know, really dig down and think about, you know, your experience when it comes to writing, user experience, human interactions, client facing experience those are really great foundations to start with and, and you can build from there i actually have one other thought on that uh, yeah. amanda uh, one of the things that i guess i found um i benefited from is like some of my own background was more in ba work business analysis work and depending yes. on the project team that you end up with um sometimes the, the conversational designer needs to have more of that soft skill focus some projects it's going to be uh handy if you've actually uh if you can read code, if you can speak the language that the developers are speaking, uh, because different sure. um, projects have different, um, you know, requirements, and so uh, there's sometimes where I have to go in and read 
you know, JSON uh, messages and uh, understand API documentation. And so if anybody out there is listening and has the technical background, but is interested in something more conversational, something more human oriented, uh, don't count yourself out either because those skills help too. Absolutely. Guys, I'm so much enjoy our conversation. Uh, Amanda, John, uh, several times uh, mentioned you and human side of uh, conversation design. Uh, so you uh, a few months ago you you've been talking about uh tips and tricks how to make a chatbot more human-like um let's say after six months as of today mm -hmm. uh what's what's new in this direction how it has evolved maybe something sure. new came to your mind from the projects you experience now sure i mean a lot of those be best practices around you know being transparent like letting people know that you, they're speaking with a bot or virtual assistant uh the bot admitting mistakes when it doesn't understand being empathetic you know ensuring that you have multiple ways to get to the same place those all still ring true um where we're seeing more advances about really creating that that human-like experience is the ability for the bot to carry on context so to have a full conversation without reiterating context. So if you say to the bot, I want to go to Mexico, um, and then they say, here are some flights available. And then I say, what's the weather? It'll know I'm talking about Mexico. It w I won't have yeah. to say, what is the weather in Mexico? So I'm so excited. I mean, I've been waiting for this for a while. And, you know, just again, with advances in technologies and NLU systems and bot platforms, we have the ability to create these really fully contextual uh, experiences, which just makes it a lot more natural. Because when you and I are speaking, we have context. We're not constantly repeating ourselves of what we're talking about. Um, so, so excited to see more of those bots in production, people engaging with them, and and just again create, having that more natural flow of conversations with a virtual assistant and a human. Cool. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, sure. Guys, from what I've heard, you know, we just like. Um, uh, in 30 minutes, we just, you know, scratch the card, just looking uh, from the very uh, high level, what yeah. conversation design is right now and how, what are the important areas inside it, uh, which have been served during the poll on our LinkedIn page. I would like you to thank you very much for being so open and explaining with great examples what is what. Um, we will continue exploring this particular topic even more uh, on our digital channels and I am happy to invite everyone who've been with us today to join uh, next week our next discussion in conversational AI space. John, Amanda, I so much appreciate your time. Thank you for Thank being you. with us uh, today. Have a great day and for those who've been with us today, have a great day too and hear you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye everyone. Thanks for watching everybody. Thank you.